Tatiana of Moscow. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. I would like to present to you a special story from my life that I lived when I was a student and as a result of which my life has never been the same. I lived this experience in my last year of study. And after it, my conception of the world and life changed radically and forever, finally leading me to accept God and the Lord Jesus Christ in my life with all conviction. Then I became a fiery end devoted servant to him, and I followed him with passion and devotion for the rest of my life. And here's why. My name is Tatiana and I was born before the Second World War, in 1935 in the former Soviet Union. I was raised and educated by my parents who were atheists and communists, in an atheistic spirit, as most of us were at that time. I knew nothing about God and I had no interest in knowing him. After graduating from high school, I became a student at the Faculty of Medicine in Moscow. In college, I began to hear from some of my colleagues talking about God but I remained indifferent to this subject. My student years passed pretty quickly one after the other. I was in my last year of college and I had a few months till graduation. I was studying hard for the final exams to get my medical degree. One day, I went to the central library in the city to study and understand some subjects related to my specialty. When I arrived at the library, at one point I heard a very clear voice speaking to me, although there was no one around me. This voice was so clear and strong that it had a particularly strong impact on me. I still remember the words I heard then. That voice told me in a very determined and authoritative tone, Do not seek happiness on earth. And do not seek wealth on earth. Seek nothing, for the earth is cursed and full of sins and the blood of innocent people. I thought then that this was probably the result of the war, it was the Second World War. And then, the voice continued, No, the earth is full not of the blood of those who have fallen on the front but of the blood of those who have been martyred, tortured, and killed over the years to this day. One T.H.E. and I asked, Okay, but what do I have to do with this? What is my fault for all these things or for the shedding of the blood of the martyrs? What do I have to do now? And my voice answered me, Repent and be reconciled to the Lord Jesus, for I want to use you to further my work. After this incident, I arrived home very scared and disturbed by what had happened to me. How could I tell my parents about this unusual occurrence? In addition to being atheists, they also had a high position in society. How will they react and what will they say? However, I decided to listen to what this voice told me and to repent in order to become a Christian, even though I didn't really know what it meant. I took courage and told my parents what had happened at the library, the voice I had heard there, the message I had received, and what I had been asked to do. My parents were very surprised by what they heard. They offered to take me to see a psychiatrist, but I flatly refused and told them that I was completely healthy so there was no need to consult a doctor. The next day I went to college and walked out of the streets of Moscow, thinking and hoping that I would meet someone, maybe a man of God, to help me or tell me what to do about it. Finding myself in this strange situation, I was always saying in my mind, if there is a man who fears God, and if God really exists and rules this world, then let me meet this man now and let him talk to me about God and tell me what to do. Not long after, a very elegantly dressed man approached me and asked me very directly, Do you know God? To which I replied in surprise, No. Then the man asks me further, But do you want to know him? I told him yes and he told me, Here, I'll tell you all about God. And he began to tell me how the world was created and all the things in it. He kept talking as if he knew the whole Bible by heart giving the impression that he knew even more than what was written in the Bible. At one point, I asked him, Okay, 
but how do you know all these things so well and tell them without even a pause or interruption, and tell me as if you learned them by heart? To and he answered me, I know them because the Most High sent me and he gave me the wisdom to know all these things I am talking about now. Then I asked him what to do. And he said, Here, I will take you to a hidden place that is secret. There are many people of God. Gathering there and there I will introduce you to them and they will tell you what to do next. A little puzzled, I asked him, But why don't you tell me what to do, because I see you know them all? No, they will teach you what to do there, the man replied. I then went with this man to a small house on the outskirts where I entered and where I found some old people praying. The man who was accompanying me came in with me. When we entered, everyone present looked at us a little puzzled, thinking we were husband and wife. The man who was with me was very elegantly dressed, and after closing the door he said, Here, I brought you a soul to salvation. Now you will tell her everything she needs to do and then baptize her in water, but do not delay the baptism for more than three days. After telling them these things, the man simply disappeared from us. He did not go out the door. Because the door was closed and he did not open it and the windows of the room were also closed. All of us present were shocked by what we had just seen, both those old people and me. And we were all terrified. We all wondered, God, what was that? We all saw that the door did not open and that the man simply disappeared from our midst as if he had evaporated instantly. We all fell to our knees and began to pray and thank God for this messenger of his whom he had sent. After that, those who were there spoke to me and explained many things from the Bible. But I already knew a lot about the Bible from this man I had met, and I was now convinced that he was an angel sent by God. I had never read the Bible, nor had I ever held a Bible in my hand, but I was now knowing many things in depth about it. Then these elders said to me, Tomorrow we will baptize you. 3 The next day I didn't go to college. I went home, prepared the things the elders had told me to prepare and returned to them where I was baptized. After my baptism, I returned home and told my parents that I had been baptized and that I had become a Christian now and would not go to college. I told them that I was not interested in doing further studies, which my parents were very indignant about. They insisted a lot on me finishing my studies, especially since I had a few more months until graduation. Then they asked me, why don't you want to finish school? I replied, I do not need more school. As far as I know, it is enough for me. From now on I want to follow God. Then, angrily they said to me, Okay if that's how you feel, forget us and leave us. Leave this place where you grew up. Then I took some clothes with me and left them. But where can I go now? Not knowing where to go, I went back to the same house where those old men were. There they arranged for me to sleep. And prepared everything I needed. I also found work at a night hospital where I had already started working. Later, I married and I lived with my husband who was also a Christian, on the outskirts of a town. In Moscow. I gave birth to three children. Shortly a few days after the birth of my fourth child, I went to a store to buy food for my family and my newborn baby. I crossed the street, and a car hit me. And I was flung to the ground injuring me very badly. I lost consciousness. I felt myself coming out of my physical body and immediately afterward, I saw again that man who had spoken to me on the street about God a few years ago, but this time he was dressed in white. It was the same angel God had sent me again. He took me by the hand and lifted me up. I was with him now, looking at my body lying on the floor all the while listening to everyone on the scene talking to each other. The militia started taking pictures of where the accident took place. In the meantime, the ambulance with the first aid doctors appeared. 
After seeing me and assessing my situation, they looked helplessly at my body and rescued me. All this time I was watching with the angel beside me what was happening and I wanted to shout, don't bother with that body and don't blame anyone, because I'm not dead, I'm alive. Here I am, I'm here. For but the angel forbade me to speak to them, saying, I allow you to see everything, but you don't have to talk to them. They will be very troubled if they hear your words. Then the doctors took my body to the emergency hospital in the ambulance. The angel was holding my hand and we were floating through the air above the ambulance until we reached the hospital. They took me to the operating room and quickly put my body on the operating table and began to prepare me for the operation. Immediately came the chief doctor, who after assessing the situation, said disappointed, there is no need to do any surgery because she's already dead. It shows no sign of life. During this time the angel said to me, let them do what they know because I will return and if necessary, I will take some emergency measures and I will solve the problem with your body. And then he continued, now you will go with me to see some great and special things, and then to tell them to others when you return to earth. And a little curious, I asked him, but do I have to go back to earth? To which he replied, Let's see what decision will be made from above. After that, the angel and I began to fly upwards, heading for the sky and rising to the stars with astonishing speed. Meanwhile, he starts talking to me and saying, Your Christian life has been a zealous life. You have done many things, but let us see what is written in all that you have done on earth. And suddenly, in the distance, a small light like a shining star can be seen. Then the angel says to me, Do you see that star up there? And I said, Yes. Alas, how far it is. To which he tells me, Yes, according to your earthly measurement, there are billions and billions of kilometers, but according to our heavenly measurement, it is an insignificant distance, nothing at all. And we were still flying at a fantastic speed when at one point we came to that star that looked like a light, but which we now saw as a large and very beautiful planet. Going further, I suddenly saw a very large and beautiful city with gates at the entrance. I entered through the gates, but at the entrance were angels standing at the gates. These gates seemed to be made of iron and were very beautiful, almost impossible to describe in words and suddenly I saw that in front of me from afar. 5 CAME on the streets of the city a light which shone very brightly, its brightness exceeding that of the sun. The sun seemed a little sparkle compared to the glow of this flame coming towards me. As this flame drew closer and closer to me, I trembled harder and harder and felt a feeling of fear and dread. As the flame drew closer and closer to me, it took on more and more contours, always changing its colors, and suddenly from that flame appears, the Lord Jesus. I had never seen the Lord Jesus before, but yet when I saw him, I knew him at once. He addressed me in a gentle voice, but did not say my name, Tatiana. He said another name. To which I said, Lord, my name is not that. I'm Tatiana. And he answered me, No. Your body on earth carries the name Tatiana but your spirit carries another name I gave when I ascended from Calvary. I wanted to memorize that name then, but I couldn't because I wasn't allowed to. Then Jesus said to me, You came up here and my servant who is now with you will show you great and important things. You will see special things. You will see what you have never been able to hear or see on earth but I will put all of them in your memory so that when you go down to earth again you will spread them and make them known to everyone among the peoples, but especially among Christians so that they may know them. And then I said, God, my Lord, couldn't I stay here and leave this angel instead? He could do a much greater job than I can as a woman. And as I know and remember, my body on earth is injured. 
it is dead and lifeless. The Lord Jesus told me, yes, but you cannot stay here in this kingdom because you are empty. Then I looked at myself and saw that I was dressed in a white robe with wide, long sleeves through which my body could not be seen, and I said, Lord, but look, I have this garment as beautiful as I've ever had. Isn't this garment my garment? And Jesus answered me, No. You did not understand what garment and what nakedness I am. Talking about. Your spirit has no fruit to bear fruit in this kingdom. In this heaven, I bring. Only those human souls that can bear fruit here. Deuteronomy 16:16 16, 16, No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. 6 A.N.D. Then I said, God, but I've worked so hard on earth. I remember that from the time I repented. Until I had this accident, I had children and many problems. I had never missed church on Sunday. In the evening or at night, I would read the Bible daily. I prayed and also gave money to the church for the poor and widows. We also helped the poor. Jesus then called an angel who came with a large book, which he opened, and the angel began to go through it, saying, Look, there's more written here than you remember. The Lord said, Nothing escaped what you did, but I want to tell you one thing, you went to church not to receive salvation. The number of your presence in the church does not mean salvation. You went to church to hear my word, to know more about biblical teachings, and to know more about me and life beyond the grave. And indeed you have become very rich in these things. You sang beautiful songs of praise about me, it's true. That was your job there. You also gave money, here is the amount of money you gave. You fasted for three hundred days. I do not remember exactly how many days the angel said to me then, but I understand that what I did in life on earth was written in that book. Then Jesus said to me, Here, I fix all these things in your mind and memory. I was very surprised that I remembered all these details then and memorized them. Then Jesus called another angel, stronger and more beautiful, who also had wings. It came from afar in flight and stood right next to Jesus and then opened another book and said, You had to fast for five hundred days until today, but you only fasted three hundred. You received many blessings and some blessings in money from which you had to give so much money to the heavenly part and so much money to the earthly part to the wretched, but you have not given a quarter of the amount you had to give. You had to preach the gospel you were prepared to preach the gospel to a number of people, but out of your mouth, you did not preach it to any quarter of them, and they did not hear it. You should have gone to the hospital because there were souls crying for help and calling for someone to go and tell them the gospel. And I have often put these things in your mind, but you have said, I am a woman. Let others go and tell them. I don't have time to visit them. I have my family and children. And it's enough that I pray for them. And the angel kept telling me all the things I had to do and didn't do. Then I lowered my head and began to cry. And the Lord Jesus said unto me, Why are you crying? 7 A and D I said, I understand that I have lost salvation and I will only see heaven for a moment. And then I will go to hell. But he said, No. You have not lost salvation until now, but I want you to return to earth. I will send my messenger to repair your body and do all your operations. The angels in heaven will do them through the hands of doctors, and they will restore your body directly, without the intervention of doctors in order to give you the chance and time to accomplish these things that you did not do. When you're back on earth, Tell all these things to all Christians and to all people who want to know God and get to heaven, wherever you go, so that they wake up. If they do not fulfill their sacred duty to the things I have left, they will by no means reach here where you are now. I brought you here only to see a part of my kingdom. Many think it is easy to get to heaven, and they think that if they give a penny or go to church on Sunday mornings and evenings, 
enduring. The weak, they are saved. These people are far from reaching my kingdom. They must work daily in my vineyard and bear fruit. They have no fruit, they are only dry branches. Some of them still have a little strength. And I always want to strengthen them to bear fruit. John 15 16 I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. The blessings I receive from my Father I give to you. They are all recorded in heaven and some parts of the blessings you must return to heaven and some parts are to be given for those below on earth, in my name. Through this, my name will be glorified. With this, everyone's place in heaven is established and through this, you and all those who want to reach heaven will be able to earn the merit of being and staying here. Yes, I know you've made a lot of plans on earth. You decided to have your own house, you wanted to have healthy children, and your husband to have a job. I knew your thoughts, I listened and I gave you everything, but you never thought about how to administer my blessings. Behold, I showed you what it means to do my will. You have left your house, your children, and your husband on earth and your body lies lifeless and you are here without the right to remain in this kingdom. Now think, what have you done with all my blessings? Here's how badly you managed them. Then I began to cry again and said, My Lord, my Savior, but you know that no corrupt words have come out of my mouth and I have endured and suffered all things. And he said, It's true, but you never gave your due. I left heaven and came to earth and gave what was most precious to my father, my life, but you did not want to give the blessings I gave you and they belonged to me, not you. You forgot and used them to your advantage. You administered. 8 a and squandered my blessings, while around you were so many who cried out and needed bread. Clothes, words of comfort, salvation, prayer, support, and lifting, and all these things you have not done. I started crying again, and I said, but now what can I do? I can't go back in time and I'm not the same age. No matter how many blessings I receive now, I will pass them all on to others. I will not hinder any of them from reaching the others so that I can reform myself before you. Then Jesus said to me, This is not possible. You will return back to earth, but before that, you will leave and go through another kingdom to realize these things, because everything that is said and written in the Bible is true. Many are wrong. Tell them when you get down, because they think that if they have been baptized in water and go to church, if they pray and give more money to the church or to the poor, they are saved. My messenger will take you to show you where these people are. I have brought you here to see all these things, for I have seen that there is more in you than there is in them. I have determined to bring you to the gates of my kingdom, and to let you pass through these gates, that I may speak to you face to face about all these things. At one point, Jesus raised his right hand upward, and the angel with that book disappeared. And then a group of angels appeared and began to tell me all the things I did every day. How surprised I was when they counted how many words I said, how many things I did, how many thoughts I had. They revealed everything to me. Absolutely nothing could be hidden or overlooked. Then another angel brought a scale and put everything on the scales. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. Proverbs 21:2. And the Lord Jesus said unto me, Now choose. If there is more on the right, you will be on the right, that is, here in my heaven. If there is more to the left, you will be in the kingdom of hell. I started to cry when I saw that there was a little more on the left, and I said, But how can that be? I consider myself a God-fearing woman and everyone around me said of me that I was holy, and... They took me as an example in my dress, speech, and walk. And the Lord Jesus said unto me, Yes, you really did these things. I weighed them all, but they 
weren't worth much because they don't weigh much in the kingdom of heaven. You did not do what you should have done, and you selfishly administered my blessings for your own benefit. I have given you many times more than I should have given you, and you should have understood. 9. That I did not give you because you deserved it. I gave you so that you have abundant to give to others. The more I gave you, the less you gave, and the more you had, the worse you administered what you received, leaving you more. Then another angel from the multitude of angels said to me, In the year after the war you had only bread and water in the house, and you could scarcely buy a litter of baby milk, and you were content and happy. After Heavenly Father began to bless you through the Lord Jesus, you made your home and got a car for your husband. Why did you do these things? You used the heavenly things for the worldly things and they will all stay there. Then I started crying again and said, Then I don't know who will get to heaven. And Jesus said, There are very few who will get here, and some may go to trial, but at the trial, everything will be weighed as it was put to you. After that the Lord Jesus disappeared and I was left with the angel looking at me. And immediately after that, he told me, We have to go, because that's what the Master said so I can take you to see another kingdom. On the way, I was thinking about the kingdom we were going to go to now, but the angel who read and knew my thoughts said to me, You're thinking now what kingdom I'm going to take you to. You'll see it, don't worry and don't think about it. I was walking with him and walking through that atmosphere that I don't even know how to describe, but what was interesting was that suddenly a river of running water appeared in front of us and I started to step on that water after the angel. Where we stepped, the water became hard. If I stepped into the water first, I would sink, but if I followed him and took my steps behind the angel, I would walk on the water like something strong. I wondered, and then I realized how great and incomprehensible is the power of God that we can scarcely comprehend. And as we went on, I could see roads in the distance. At one point I arrived at a place I had never seen before. I realized that I was now entering and already stepping into the other kingdom that the Lord Jesus had spoken to me about. As we got closer and closer, desperate cries and screams were heard from afar, tears, and a pitiful, heart-breaking pain was felt everywhere. I did not know what was going on but I suspected that we were now approaching the kingdom of hell, so I said to the angel, We may not go there because I can't. I am calm and quiet in my own way. I never argue with my children or my husband, and I never liked the noise, the pain, and the crying, but what you hear. From there, I don't know, I wouldn't want to go. 10AND the angel said, I have to take you because that's what the Lord Jesus said. Then the angel went ahead and at one point reached some iron gates. When he came near them, I saw some mighty angels dressed as soldiers, wearing black clothes with large yellow buttons and golden swords in their hands. When they saw the angel of the Lord Jesus with me, they opened the gates and fell to the ground before him. Then the angel said to me, When I show up here, no one has power. I went in through those gates, and said to the angel, Oh, but I can't see that. And the angel said, Why? I was surprised at seeing some who were there. I said, I know some people here. He was with me in church. I know this sister, I know this brother too. He was our pastor for several years. I know them. How did they get here? They were so tormented there, and when they saw me, they said, How did you get here? You appeared to be more God fearing, more restrained. We were more libertine, and look, we're all here now. I looked at them and asked, What are you doing here? Then the angel said to me, Speak everything you want to talk about, don't be afraid. Ask everything you want to ask. Then I asked him again, What are you doing here? 
And they answered me, They brought us here and as you can see, we are tormented all the time. We rarely have a break. The demons here put us in a big valve and pour over us a kind of water. Like a flame of fire that burns us so that we are melting. Then, forced by demons, they open our mouths and pour into our mouths with a funnel, water with flames that burn our ears, nose, mouth, and eyes. If we had at least a drop of water here, we could put out this fire that burns and torments us terribly and would quench our thirst and the burns we have. We don't know exactly how long we're going to stay here. Some of us know, some don't. At one point a large building appeared in front of us. There are no such big buildings on earth. We both entered this building and went down its corridor. There a gate was opened and beyond this gate was the abode of the old serpent, of the devil sitting on a throne of flames of fire, with a wreath of one one red flowers on his head. He held in his hand a fork with three gold and yellow colored horns. When he hit the floor with it, sparks came out. Then all his servants came and spoke before him. The devil said, they were all once Christians and did not do the will of the risen one. Torment them now, for before the judgment they are ours, and after the judgment, it is not known whose they will be. They will be ours or we don't know yet. Then I understood with grief that they would stay in this terrible and awful place until judgment, and I asked the angel, when will the trial be? Is it impossible to be soon? The angel said, no, the day of judgment is set at the end of the thousand years of the kingdom of God of the Lord Jesus on earth. I realized that the thousand years is still a long time away and they have to suffer in that awful place for a long time. Then the angel said to me, yes, they suffer here. Some suffer for a thousand years, but there are others who suffer for more than a thousand. They must suffer here until the day of judgment. And then their fate will be decided. It is unknown at this time what they will do after leaving the place. But what wrong could they have done to get here? I asked the angel. And the angel answered me, very simple. Here we go now and you will meet one of them. You don't know him and he doesn't know you either, but he will tell me everything about himself in my presence and he will recognize everything. And the angel departed and talked with him, and he told him all the evil that he had done in his life on the earth. Among other things, he told the angel how he loved quarreling, how he liked to speak ill of others, and how this was a comfort and a joy to him. He liked to criticize and blame everyone. He loved money and wealth and began to rise and prosper. He liked to be honored and be given importance. He said all these things and acknowledged these deeds that he has done before the angel, saying, Yes, they are true. Then the angel continued, These passions appeared to him after five or six years of repentance and he is now burdened by them. He never confessed his sins to God, did not mourn them, and did not repent of them. He did not give up on them and therefore he cannot come to heaven because he is not ready. When he is judged, everything he has done will be weighed, and the good things, the twelve prayers, the tears, the alms, the help given to the poor and the widows, those whom he comforted and all that he did and spoke and all the evil things and deeds that he has done will be put on the scales. At the trial, we will see and know absolutely everything that every soul has done on earth. Whether it has been done by faith and love or not. Maybe God's love will rehabilitate some of them. But that's not the point. They will never reach the city of heaven, the city of the Most High, the eternity where the Lord Jesus dwells. They will be in another part of the universe. They will be established in another place and they will have a different destiny a different eternity with other laws, with other forms of coexistence, etc. Then we went but I told the angel that I did not want to go further and enter this kingdom because I am terrified and I cannot bear to see those who are tormented there. But he said, I can't, 
that's my order from above and that's what I was ordered to do. And then we kept going and going deeper, and we saw all sorts of awful things. But the worst thing was when I passed a big black cast iron wall, ten meters thick, and when I saw it I was very surprised how they were able to build it, and at the end, there was a door creaking loudly. At one point this door opened and I entered it and there I saw the atheists, the communists, and all those who blasphemed and rejected God and the Lord Jesus, they were all here. I met many of those who were here. Among them were those who taught me at school, and to my great pain, I saw my parents here as well. The torment that was here could not be compared to the torment I saw where those who were once Christians were. Where I was now, the torment was much greater and more terrible and much harder to bear. Here it was full of all the animals and beasts of the field, crawlers, and snakes that bit them. They tigers rushed upon them and tore at them, but their flesh was put back, and they were then in terrible pain. The moans and screams are here all the time, uninterrupted. It is an indescribable horror to see them in the torments and sufferings in which they are constantly struggling here. When they looked at me, they recognized me, and one of them said and called me by name. Blessed are you who have left everything on earth and followed the Lord Jesus, for we who are here now have no chance or hope. 13 During this time, I began to cry. And they thought that I was weeping for their mercy, but I was actually weeping thinking of myself and my condition, because although I was better than they, I still had no right to remain in the heaven of the Lord Jesus. I was deeply and profoundly impacted after seeing all the torments and sufferings here, the way people who do not know and do not accept God suffer, the way Christians who sinned and lived an ugly life suffer. In the eyes of God, those who have not accepted the guidance of the Holy Spirit in their lives and deeds, but have guided themselves are religious atheists and suffer the same lot as atheists. It is awful to see all these things and many, many other things and scenes that I have seen on this journey and that it is almost impossible for me to describe in human words. Both the heavenly kingdom of the Lord Jesus and the kingdom of the devil far surpass the imagination of any man on earth and it is often impossible to describe them in human words. After the kingdom of darkness, the angel who accompanied me and I both returned to earth. I passed through the atmosphere of the earth, and at one point I saw myself above my hometown. Everything seemed gloomy. Before I went on this trip, the city looked beautiful to me, but now the buildings looked gloomy and the city was dark and foreboding. We were heading to the place where my body was and so I arrived at the morgue of the hospital where I saw my body, lying dead. I entered the morgue with the angel and looked at my lifeless body and the angel allowed me to touch it. It was stiff and cold. Then the angel said to me, it's been three days since you left your body on this trip. I told him then that I should already be buried, and I asked him why they had not buried my body earlier and why they had kept it so long in the morgue. The angel said to me, because I ordered this and because I had power of attorney from the Lord Jesus, but now you will enter your body again. I will work on your head to put your brain back. I will close the cranial box and you will remain as you were and you will regain your senses and knowledge. You had your head crushed and your legs and spine were broken. Then he continued, they will put your feet and hands in plaster. I will stay here and watch you. Until you recover, and as for your spine and brain, I will take care of them and put them back. One for and then I asked the angel, okay, but when the doctors see, what will they say? And the angel answered me, nothing. It is nothing because the body is frozen. When I lay my hands on it, it will thaw. And indeed, when the angel laid his hands on it, the frozen body became soft. At this time, I felt a great power and I was absorbed back into the body, and then I went back into it. I then felt the two warm hands of the angel on my head and then I suddenly became conscious. Again and regained all my senses. 
During this time the hospital maid entered the morgue, and when I saw her I said to her, You don't have anything to wrap me in, because I'm very cold here on this cold table you put me on. The maid, as if maddened by what she saw, slammed the morgue door, running and shouting as the guard held her, The dead has risen, the dead has risen. The chief physician immediately came, who was also afraid to approach, but when he entered the morgue, I asked him, Why are you afraid? What happened? He was visibly disturbed by what he now saw before his eyes and said to me, Your head was crushed and your brain came out of the skull. Now it's back and, you can talk and see everything clearly. Then I told the doctor and those present, I will tell you everything. Don't be afraid. Just put my hands and feet back in plaster so that I can heal faster because the angel is here with me. I could see the angel, but they couldn't see him. Then, still frightened, they took me out of the morgue, but the maid still did not have the courage to approach and shouted loudly that the devil had worked miracles. And I said to her then, Why do you honor the devil? God is the one who performed the miracle. But in her disbelief, the poor woman no longer knew what to believe and shouted in the hospital corridor that the devil had performed miracles. 15 THEY put my hands and feet in plaster and then they healed, and the angel sat next to me every night and I could see him, but those around me could not see him. In the evening, when I was praying, he would appear by my bed and say to me gently and lovingly, Rest in peace. And the next morning when I woke up I felt better. With each passing day, I was recovering. More and more and soon they let me go home. When the doctors at the hospital gave my husband the news that I was going to be discharged, he couldn't believe it. I left the hospital shortly after and returned home, but to my surprise I found a lot of pain and grief. My husband had already bought and prepared the coffin for my funeral the grave was dug in the cemetery, and the family and relatives were ready to go to my funeral. I also saw the clothes in my wardrobe that they had already prepared for everyone to give to the poor. When we got home, you can imagine what a big shock it was for everyone. I told everyone about the experience of my journey outside the body, where I was, what I saw and everything I was told I had to say. I told them in detail everything I saw, heard, and felt in the two kingdoms I was taken to. In these three days, it was hard for my husband to believe all this although I lived with him every day. In the same house, he always asked me, Tatiana, are you really? Aren't you another woman who looks like my wife? And the doctors wrongly sent her? Only I went to the hospital and saw you with your head. Crushed dead and frozen in the morgue. You do not have a cut on your head and no trace of the accident now. Your head is whole and your broken spine is now straight, how? I told my husband everything again, in great detail, but even a year after this event, he still couldn't believe that I was his real wife, until one night, God showed him in a dream that everything I had told him was true, and from then on he did not doubt it. He became even more convinced and Realized the truth when I began writing about this experience and sending thousands and thousands of letters throughout the former Soviet Union and around the world. I managed to translate them into several languages and I also made tapes that I sent everywhere to warn Christians about all these things, but also those who sincerely seek God, as he asked me. The Lord Jesus conveys this message especially to Christians and tells them not to take upon themselves the blessings of God for their own self-interest or benefit as even their bodies do not belong to them. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who through all that he says glorify the Father and the Son. Jesus tells Christians to live a holy and pure life, to weigh everything they do and speak, because it is not enough for them to attend a church. They need to fast and pray more but at the same time. They need deeds by which God is truly glorified and praised. 16 TRUST more in fasting and prayer, 
and do not do things or deeds by which you will receive praise or gratitude from those around you, but do these deeds so that all praise, honor, and glory may be brought to those entitled to receive them, that is, to the Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus. Jesus also showed me that many Christians work on earth just to be exalted and honored. They want to be appreciated and exalted in earthly glory and be honored by those around them, but God says, I want all my glory to be given to me. I have blessed them. They are enslaved without rights. I have redeemed them through my Son. Neither their body nor their soul and spirit belong to them. Therefore, beloved brothers and sisters, and all who read these lines, administer wisely all that God has given you. Do not come to him empty-handed, for it is not the attendance of a church that saves your soul. It is true that you must do the same, but come to him with sheaves, come to him with fruit, come to him with all the faith you have in you, and pass on to others of your faith, thus honoring the Father and the Son. Give what is most precious to the Lord and in the name of the Lord. He left the heaven, of which I also saw a part, and came down here on earth, among us and for us, to lay down his life for our redemption. What more could he do? What greater proof of his love could he give us? It is terrible to meet with the Lord Jesus and then be sent away from the gates of his kingdom. That is why, in his holy and most high name, Lord of eternal glory, I pray at the end. Administer with wisdom and love all that you have and all that you do. Do his will in all your ways. Do not seek for your own benefit, but seek for the benefit of others. By seeking the benefit of others, you also give them a chance to reach God in the high kingdom. May God bless you and save us all so that we can meet happily at the end of this earthly journey. Up there in his wonderful kingdom. Give this wonderful message of his to others. Translated from the Romanian. Article, https slash slash crestinism authentic dot blogspot dot com slash p slash marjorie iriad dot html e. 17.